Okay, we go to John. John chapter 1, verse 14. The last time we were in John, we were looking at born of God. Okay, we go to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Okay, now, here we are dealing with the story or the mystery of the incarnation. You know the story from Luke, the visit of the angel to the Virgin Mary. And I don't know, but it's good to get the concept of what really transpired there. You know, Hebrews, say, Hebrews 10 says that when he was coming into the world, what he said was, you have prepared a body for me. So, he became a man by entering into the body prepared for him. That's why he retains his full deity. So, you see, it's important to understand the incarnation. And incarnation is not that Mary gave birth to a man. No, Mary gave birth to Jesus, all right. But the Christ entered the body created in the womb of Mary. And that's why our Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Yes, you understand it that way. You will not be able to explain or, or comprehend why he is fully God and is fully man. He put on that body as a dress. The living word put on the body. Okay, and that's why they say the word became flesh. The word became flesh. And because he became flesh, he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Okay, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, full of mercy, compassion, full of. Uh, 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 unmerited dispensing unmerited favor you know in all his life and ministry dispensing unmerited favor even sometimes purely out of compassion people did not solicit his desire like the widow of men he saw the wickedness of the death in the death of the only son of a widow. And he wouldn't let the spirit of death get away with it. He called the young man back to life. So, so full of grace, full of mercy and compassion. Okay. Now, when the scriptures also say, only begotten of the Father. Now, this is the story of pre-existence couched in this language. No. Begotten of the Father. The Son is begotten of the Father. You see, in the, in the creed, um, is it a Nicene creed? I think it's the Nicene creed. What is read is begotten, not made. Being, being of one, one substance, substance with, the, with father. the Father. You know, you, you catch the sense of some, some duplication, you know, 
that the father just duplicated himself in the son. But you see, you see, when we say that, then our, our critics pick us up on that. So do you have three gods, one God? <laughs> and we reiterate that we have one God. So how come there are three? Now, one of the things that uh, uh, we used to explain that is that there is one God who for purposes of man's redemption has expressed and manifested himself in three persons of Son, Father, Son, and Spirit. But it's one God. And then somebody comes and says, how can you have one God and have three? And this is where we stop and say, this is the mystery. You cannot, you cannot penetrate it beyond, be, beyond that. And the Apostle Paul has already said that when we get there, then we will see and know all things clearly. But now we're still seeing a mirror dimly. Okay. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, obviously. Because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And of his fullness, we have all received. And grace for grace. Now, now, the Apostle Paul explains this better when he says that we are transformed into his image. When we behold him, you know, behold his glory, we are transformed into his image, but from glory to glory, you know, it's a progressive thing. Nobody uh, wakes up one morning and becomes like Jesus. No. It's through obedience, it's through uh, 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 service, it's through the pursuit of the divine will that we begin to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. As you read this, you begin to realize that um, the, the, the message of grace was crystallizing. You know, the message of grace. Now, now, the way our Lord Jesus Christ preached this message of grace is in Luke 24, I think it's 45. Luke 24 and 45. Let's see what he says. Then he said, to them, and he opened their understanding. Then he said to them in verse 40, For this is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. Then verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is the first inkling that Jesus gave of the message of grace, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name in Jerusalem. So this is the core gospel, you know, this is the core gospel, remission of sin, so that the burden of the past can be lifted and men and women can go forward to live holy. It's always important to understand it, but what Jesus came to do is to release us from the burden of all our past sins so that we can then turn around and go forward. You know, they asked a group of eight-year-olds, what is repentance? Eight-year-olds, what is repentance? They said many things. And then one boy raised his hand and said, this is what repentance means. It's like a man going in one direction. Then he meets our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he turns around and goes in the opposite direction. That's exactly what repentance is. You know, you turn around. Anybody that comes to Christ and there is no turn around, then something is missing. There must be a turn around. Repentance and remission of sin. There must be a turn around. Okay. The grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
No one has seen God at any time. That's a fundamental fact. No one has seen God at any time. He told Moses, you can't see me and still be on this side. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has given us a revelation of him. Now, take that to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So, John declares the same truth. No man has seen the God at any time. He's the only begotten Son. And Jesus says here in Matthew, anybody who wants to know God, they have to come to the Son to reveal the Father to them. And so, in revealing the Father to them, he actually reveals himself because, you see, that's why he said to uh, 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 um, Philip in John chapter 14, Ah, don't you know that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? So, what do you want to know of the Father? You cannot know his glory. What you want to know is his nature. Is his nature, you know. And he gave it in bits and pieces. You can, you can pick up that, I think it's uh, Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 1. Exodus 34, verse 5. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. So now, this knowledge, when a man grows in the knowledge of God, he uses it in the relation, in his relationship with God. I want to show you how Moses used it in Numbers 14. Um, um, and the prayer of Moses in Numbers 14. And Moses, verse 13, said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up, up from among them. They will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among them. No, no, this is not the one I'm looking for. And now, aha, verse 17, and now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying that Lord, see, Moses uses the same thing that he received at Torah. The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of these people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven these people from Egypt, even until now. So it is that knowledge that we gain from all these bits and pieces about the nature of God that we use when we come to intercession. You know, God is long-suffering. He's abundant in mercy. He forgives iniquity and transgression. Even though he may still hold the guilty accountable. Okay. So, so when we learn about God in the Bible, it is so that we can have a meaningful relationship a meaningful relationship with him and so that his fear the fear of god will be real to us because we know we know him that's why when you say you know god it's not because you've been to heaven and back no it's because you picked up all these things in the bible the various things that speak about the nature and character of god and you use them in your own life so you you don't become presumptuous you and i don't become presumptuous 
in our relationship with God. Okay, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So when people make some statements about God, that oh, um, um, having forgiven us in Christ Jesus, it cannot uh, uh, take us to hell again, whether we sin or we don't sin. You don't know where they get that. Because you cannot have only one section of God. You have to, you have to uh, put everything together so that you don't become presumptuous. Like David prayed in Psalm 19, save me from presumptuous sins. Okay. So let our relationship with God be born of truth, knowledge of the truth about God as revealed in his word so that in truth we can, like Jesus said, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth according to the revelation knowledge of Christ that he has given to us. And the revelation knowledge of God that Christ has given to us. Amen. <laughs>